Hello, my friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Restore Online. My name is Troy McMahon, and I just have the privilege to be the lead pastor here at Restore. And I just want to say, wherever you happen to be today, I'm grateful that you're making a decision to join us, because today it's the 4th of July. It's Independence Day. And we are continuing this series we're in called Future Family. And, and we're in week four of this series. And I'll tell you, over the course of the last three weeks, it's been really powerful for me, and I hope for you. We kicked it off by talking about the ideal versus the real. I mean, we all live in reality, but we have this ideal of what our families or what our relationships could look like, and we don't want to give it up because we want to continue to grow from the reality of where we are to where we want to be. And then we talked about the power of mutual submission, about how when we submit to one another, it really changes the dynamic of the relationship. And then last week, we talked about risky reconciliation, How literally when you and I are willing to step into reconciliation, that it can bring relationships that are dead back to life. Well, here we are today, and we are going to lean into and talk about family conflict. Now, we all come from families that are way, way different. As a matter of fact, the only thing that we may absolutely have in common with each other in our families is that, well... We have conflict, right? We all fuss and we all fight. And there's something that I've learned over time, and you've probably learned this too, is that when you win an argument inside your family, you really don't win. As a matter of fact, if you go to work, right, and if you happen to win an argument at the office and uh, you uh, get a high five because you won, If you win an argument in the boardroom or the courtroom, you tend to get a reward for it. But if you happen to win an argument in the living room or the bedroom, well, there's really no win, is there? I mean, you might feel good for a second because you out-argued the other person, but there's no win. So the conflict is never really resolved. You know, conflict in family, it's, it's like conflict nowhere else. Because it's so complicated, because it's so emotional, and it just seems to go on and on and on. You know, part of what makes family conflict so uh, difficult and complicated is that we don't even approach the conflict the same depending upon who we are as individuals. See, see, when it comes to, to family conflict, some of us, some of us were peacekeepers, right? And if you're a peacekeeper, man, you won't even argue. And you're like, okay, okay, whatever, whatever, whatever you can do to remove the conflict as soon as possible that you try to get away from it versus resolve it. And and I'll tell you, you can't even get a peacekeeper to push back when you want to argue. They're just saying, hey, it's fine, it's fine. See, if you're fine, they're fine. Even if you know it's not really the truth. Some of you, you're peacekeepers. And then, well, there's the sulker, right? Some of you are sulkers. You're just kind of down. And even after the conflict it happens to get somewhat resolved, it's like, are you okay? I'm fine. You don't seem fine. It's like your spirit animal happens to be Eeyore, and then there's the stuffer, right? You know the person where, is everything okay? Yes, yeah, fine, fine. It's just fine, it's fine, it's fine. They won't address the issue, so they just take whatever conflict and they just stuff it inside them. You know that person. You might even be that person. And then there's the litigator. Now, litigators happen to be the best arguers. And if you're a litigator, you always win. You are never wrong, or at least you don't think you are ever wrong. And because you're such a good arguer, the rest of the people in your family, well, they don't want to argue with you because, well, they know you're going to win the argument. But even after you've won the argument, you realize, well, I haven't really won anything. And then, of course, there's the screamer. And these are the people who just have to yell. Now, notice, if you came out of a family where everybody in your family had this tendency just to raise their voice when conflict occurred, and you now happen to be married, you probably did not marry somebody uh, uh, who happens to be a screamer. You married somebody that's another type. 
Now, most of the time, it's probably not a litigator because they can raise their voice as well. You probably ended up marrying somebody who's a sulker or a stuffer or maybe even a peacekeeper. And do you remember the first argument that you had? You yelled and your husband or your wife, they looked at you like you were from outer space and they're like, whoa, what is this? Because they didn't come from a family that yelled or raised their voices and it was strange. And then all of a sudden you realize the volume of your words weighed a thousand pounds and the words and the volume could crush people. And they wouldn't argue back, and they wouldn't yell back, and they just thought something was wrong with you. And they tried, they tried to explain to you that you shouldn't yell, but you tried to explain back to them that, hey, you just got to get things out. And neither of you won. You see, it's just complicated. But there's going to be conflict. As long as families exist, there will be conflict conflict. And the thing is this, even though there are many, many, many versions of people and different approaches to conflict, what we're going to discover today is that there is only one source of conflict in the family. That's it, just one. And truthfully, it's kind of personal and it can be ugly. But if we can wrap our brains and our hearts around this, and I can tell you this idea, and I promise you, It will lower the tension level, the conflict level, the tone. It will decrease instantly inside your relationships and your family. That's how powerful this principle is. Now, to explain it, I'm going to get some help. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get all the help from Jesus' half-brother, James. Now, James, he wrote a letter to Christians in the church in the first century, 2,000 years ago. And that letter that he wrote to the church, it became part of what we know as our Bible, the New Testament, and it's creatively known as the book of James. And in this book, he introduces this profound relational insight that probably is one of the most powerful tools that we can find for relationships and conflict in all the Bible. And in this, James introduces the principle and the concept with a question. Here's how he starts. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Seems like a reasonable question. And we've all got an answer to it, right? I mean, we might answer, well, I'll tell you, because my husband won't do this. My wife, you know, well, she's not careful. She spends all the money. Well, he doesn't work hard enough. He's not sensitive, and she just soaks around. My kids, they won't behave. My parents, they don't understand. My teenager daughter, she won't clean up her room. My kids, they keep wearing each other's clothes, and then they leave them strewn out all over the place, and it goes on and on and on. And when you and I answer the question of what causes fights and quarrels among you, we instantly get our finger out, start to point at others, and we begin to blame Here's the truth. As long as you blame others for your unhappiness, you will always be unhappy. Every time, every single time that you begin to blame, you take your happiness, right, my happiness, and I hand it to the person that I'm in conflict with. It's crazy. It's like, hey, you know, I can't stand you right now, but here, I'm going to give you my potential for happiness, and you go ahead and you hold on to it, and then you give it back to me whenever you want to, because I can't be happy unless you allow me to be happy. (laughs) No one would do that on purpose, but every time, every time I blame, I give away my happiness. Now, I don't want to do that one. I want to be happy. You don't want to give yours away. You want to be happy. But part of refusing to do that, part of learning how not to do that, is what James is going to explain to us today. So let me encourage you right now. If you've got your your Bible app on your phone, I I want to encourage you to read this along with just a few verses out of the book of James. But sometimes when we look at it right here in context here, uh, it'll also be on the screen, but it can really kind of jump off the page. We're going to go to James, which is a book in the New Testament. We're going to go to the fourth chapter. So James chapter four. Now, When we dive into this, uh, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you some things, and you're going to want to push back. 
you're going to want to resist. As a matter of fact, you might even want to argue with me. And I want to say, that's okay. I didn't come up with this stuff. I'm not smart enough. I'm not bold enough. The only reason that I want to stand here and really teach this to you today and teach to myself is because it's right here in our true source, the Bible. And I believe that if we'll lean in and do this hard work, it can radically change the relationships we have around us and particularly in our family. So here's how James starts. He asks, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he answers the question with kind of a statement question. Don't they come, that is the quarrels and fights, from your desires that battle within you? So he says right now, hey, I'm going to answer the question. Your quarrels and fights, they come from desires inside you. And our response is, no, they don't, James. My quarrels and fights, they come from stuff outside me. They're because my husband won't do things. My, my wife won't do things. It's because of others, what they've done or what they haven't done. And James says the source of all your fights, all your quarrels, is not something that comes out of them or from them, but something that comes inside of you. You have a desire. And every single conflict with every single person whom you've ever been in conflict with, specifically family, there is a desire that you have that's spilling out on the people all around you. And James continues on. He says, you desire, right? You have this desire inside you, but you do not have. So you have this desire, this desire that's unmet, this desire that's unfulfilled. And every time there's a conflict, you want something. Every time you've had a conflict with anybody in your family, even when it's the same thing over and over and over again, there's something you want and you don't have. And then James puts this tagline on this, you desire but do not have, so you kill. Whoa. Whoa. I mean, James is writing this letter to the church. He's not writing it to folks that are in prison. He's not writing to death row. He's writing to the church, and yet he says, you, so you kill. I mean, he is way overstating it. He is using hyperbole. But it's extraordinarily relevant when we think, okay, about what happens in families when we quarrel and fight, when we have unresolved conflict. Here's what he says. Here's what happens. Sometimes, sometimes there's things that you want so badly or I want so badly. There are things that we want to such extent that to get those things, we're just willing to run over and hurt the people that are closest to us, that matter the most, just to get what we want. So you kill. And when we don't learn that you and I, we have the potential, the propensity, we have both the opportunity and the motive to do this and we don't learn from it, then we destroy our closest relationships. You see, when you want something from someone, whether it's your husband or your wife, your brother or sister, could be your son or daughter, or maybe even your mother or father, if you want it badly enough, and in the midst of your desire to get that, you lose perspective Well, then what happens is we pursue it so much that we destroy the relationship with that person. I mean, it's happened again and again and again. And the whole time that you're arguing, the whole time that you're fussing or nagging or belittling, you're trying to tell yourself, it's them, it's them, it's them. And James says, no, 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 it's you It's you, it's you. You want something, and you're not getting it. So you're going to use your words and your actions and whatever you possibly can to get it one way or another. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine what would happen in our homes and in our relationships if we just owned this one idea? Well, James continues on. He says, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. 
So he starts with it, unpacks it, and comes right back to it. We're right back to where we began. So James is super clear. He says, why don't we get along in our family? It's because each of us wants something of the other, and we can't get it. So here, here's what I want to just spend maybe a minute or two doing, all right? I want us to pause, and I want us just to do a little application, Right, so here's what you do. I want you to kind of imagine for me a conflict. Maybe it was a conflict last week or a conflict last month or maybe a conflict that you had over the last year. And what if in the middle of that argument or that conflict, you would do this? You would literally stop for a moment, look at the other person and say, hey, do you know what part of the problem is right now? Part of the problem is I'm not getting what I want. Could you imagine if you could make that statement in the midst of the heat of the art of it? If you did, it would be a game changer. So let's practice it, okay? Get ready. This is one of those situations where you're on the verge, right? You're on the verge of losing control. You're in the middle of losing control, and suddenly you remember, ah, oh, this message from this sermon uh, from James, and it dawns on you. And all of a sudden, as you're trying to point fingers, wait, wait, wait a minute, part of the problem, now I'm not saying all the problem, I'm just saying maybe a little itty bitty part of the problem is uh, me. My desires not being met. Part of this conflict problem is I'm not getting what I want. Now go ahead, say that wherever you are right now. I'm not getting what I want. I'll tell you what, there's some of you right now, you're watching and you're listening and you're thinking, oh, Troy, I so wish my husband could hear this. I wish my wife, I wish my middle school or my high school or my adult children, you see, there you go again. Isn't that the issue? It's, it's them. They need to hear this. And James is going, really? <laughs> really? One more time, with that, I want you to literally, do you know what part of the problem is? Go ahead, say it out loud. I am not getting what I want. Can you imagine what would happen in your home, in my home, in our relationships, if this just became the habit? Now, unfortunately, uh, most of us won't do this. Because even, right, if I own just a little bit of the problem, here's what happens. When I own just a part of the problem in the midst of, the, uh, of, the midst of all this tension, right, the temperature of conflict just goes whoosh. All of a sudden, your energy, your litigating, your arguing, whatever you've got going on, the moment you own any of it, the tension just decreases. And you lose part of the argument. And you lose part of your leverage. And James is like saying, yeah, yes. If everyone, everyone in the family would own their part, well, then everyone would lose a little leverage. And guess what would happen? You would fight and quarrel so much less. Now, I know. I know as you're listening, you've got the red light flashing, objection, objection, objection. I know, so just let me go ahead and say it. Your objections, well, he promised, or she promised, or, man, I'm not asking something unusual. Or, Troy, you don't know. We made a commitment to one another. We said, till death do us part. Or we made this commitment with our child or my brother or even my parents. Man, we said, if we pay for this, well, then you'll do this. And we did it. And they didn't. And they promised, and they promised, and they promised. Okay, I understand. I understand the, the angst, the hurt that comes from unmet expectations, unfulfilled desires. But, but what if it were more like this? I want you to keep your promise, and I'm not getting what I want. I want you to fulfill your marriage vow, and I'm not getting what I want. I want you to do what you said you would do, and I'm not getting what I want. And suddenly, 
as you're wrestling through these conflicts, instead of just looking at the person you're in conflict with, you start to reflect and see yourself in the mirror. And it changes things. But James, he doesn't end there. He goes on and says, you do not have because you do not ask God. This is powerful. James, all of a sudden, is going to take us deeper spiritually. And he looks right at us in the eye and says, you don't have because you don't ask God. And this is so important. James is trying to have us reflect and think, has it occurred to you that sometime before you go extracting something for some, from someone else for your benefit, before you begin raging in there, has it occurred to you to literally get on your knees and pour out your heart to God? To literally say, God, God, there's something I want from my kids. God, there is something that I want from my husband or my wife. There is something that I want from my mother or my father. And God, I'm just not getting it. Now, I know, I, I know, I know that some of you do this. Before you start, before you confront, you get on your knees and you pray. You say, God, God, I, I have to talk to him again. God, you'll be here at 430. Help me. God, I'm on my way home right now. Prepare me and prepare them. And you ask God, and you know what happens? When, when you and I, when we begin to bring these things to God, that little piece, that little kind of itty-bitty piece that is my fault, all of a sudden it helps me kind of reorient my focus, and I start to see that there's as much for me to focus on so that I don't just completely focus on them. And when that happens, I can absolutely guarantee you the conversation will go better. Because you begin knowing part of this problem is I'm just not getting what I want. And I begin to understand that part of what I do want, well, you don't even have to give. And then James, well, he, he concludes this instruction and James has this way of kind of getting you through some tough challenge and then all of a sudden throwing down the hammer. And this instruction we really don't like. He says, when you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Man, I've prayed for lots of things, lots of things in relationships and lots of things in conflict, and God has not done it my way, and it's really tough. It's tough. Because in some cases, God didn't give me what I want, and God won't give you what you want, because God, man, I do believe he loves you and I so much. He doesn't want to mess you up. He doesn't want to mess me up by giving us everything that we want or that we ask for. James, James is... It is saying, have you taken this to God? And we're going, yeah, I have. And then he's saying, can you take no for an answer? And at the same time, can you own your part of it? Because I have to recognize and you have to recognize that sometimes in the midst of this conflict, sometimes in the midst of the things that I want that I'm not getting, that it really is all about me. It's all about you. And it's not about what's best for everyone involved. So let me kind of close our time by kind of asking you a question. Who in your family? Who in your family is suffering because you're not getting your way? Who in your family kind of feels the pressure to change, the pressure to behave, the pressure to start, the pressure to stop, the pressure just to work harder? Who is feeling pressure because they just don't measure up to your expectations? And let me ask you, what would happen today if your family, with your brother or sister, your father or mother, your son or daughter, no matter who they are, how old, if in fact you 
we're able to relieve them of some of that pressure or some of that expectation. Because many of people within your sphere of relationships, they are still living with expectations you laid on them. And every time you're together, you're just thinking, man, I'm not living up to it. I'm not measuring up. And if I could be so honest to let you know that I believe it's probably your issue and not theirs. Who out there right now is suffering because you refuse to own the fact that this conflict might have more to do with you than it does with them? And what could happen? What could happen if you made the bold move today through a letter through an email or text or a phone call, maybe a lunch or an appointment, and you began this journey of taking away the unnecessary and inappropriate pressure that you've placed on them, and you release it. Do you know why you quarrel and fight with your family? It's because you're not getting what you want. And do you know why your family quarrels and fights back? Because they're not getting what they want. You know, in the ideal world, in the ideal family, in a family where men and women are really seeking to know God and follow Jesus, there would be a pause before the storm. There would be a pause and a reflection before the conversation. There would be this come to Jesus, come to God moment where I say, God, before I start this conversation, before I confront her, because things in our families, things in our relationship, they need to be confronted before I sit down and I address it with him because there are so many things that need to be spoken about and need to be addressed. Before I launch into that, God, I just want to recognize what it is I want. And I want the what I want part, God, to be dealt with here, here, before I take it over there. Man, we live in the real, but I really believe God is hoping that we would stretch ourselves to experience more and more of the ideal. God, do in me what you need to do in me first. Do you know the source of fighting and quarrel that you have within your family? You do now. You want something, and you're not getting it. That's the reality for all of us. So why not? Why not take that to God? Why not just own it? And maybe for some of us today, as we begin this week to see conflict all around us or conflict within our family, that would just say, God, I'm not getting what I want. God, do some work in me so that you can do some work through me. God, I'm not getting what I want. Help me to lean into you before I tear into them. Help me to be changed on the inside so my conversation on the outside is rich and full of grace and mercy and love. God, change me through this conflict and leave my family better because of who you are in me and through me. Let's pray. Father God, we all have conflict inside our family. (laughs) You demonstrated that from the very first family in the Bible, (laughs) in Adam, okay? Oh, and Eve, and through their sons, God. E- even when Jesus and his family had conflict, God, there was conflict everywhere. So, God, we know that conflict is real and that we have to have this reality that conflict will exist. So help us, Father, to understand that the conflict that I have with every person happens because I want something and I'm not getting what I want. So help me just to acknowledge that, Father, so that you can begin to do a work in me, so that you can fill me up to the places that I'm looking for others to fill me up, so that you can fill me up with grace and truth and love, so when I sit down with my spouse or with my brother or sister or my mother or father or my children, God, that I'm full of grace and truth, the real and the ideal. And God, use it to change our families. 
Use it to change the future of our families, not because we're good enough, but because of what you have done for us through Jesus Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for checking out the message today. I hope it was an encouragement to you. You'll find a lot more messages on our website, restorecc.org or our YouTube page, Restore CC. Go ahead and check those out. And if you find it helpful, let us know that you're watching by leaving a comment down below. Uh, Hope that you're doing well. We'll see you soon. Take care.